Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about circular convolution. This is the convolution that results in the time domain when we multiply two discrete Fourier transforms in the frequency domain. So to spell that out a little more carefully, suppose we say that x of k is the discrete Fourier transform, so we'll just abbreviate that as DFT, of some sequence, time, finite length time sequence x of n, and we do that with some DFT size n, right, where this is the number of samples we've taken in frequency. And we just do, the, do the same thing for our filter, h of k is the DFT of our impulse response, h of n, with the same DFT size is very important. So this is our signal represented in the frequency domain by a finite number of samples, and this is the uh, frequency response, h, we define a new Fourier transform, or discrete Fourier transform, just by multiplying h and x for each value of k. So then the question is, if we now do an inverse DFT, which we abbreviate IDFT, with the same size for this new signal, what do we get? Right, so if I take y of k and take its inverse dft with n samples, what's the time domain signal? On one hand, we're used to our, our standard duality intuition tells us that multiply and frequency, right, is the same as some kind of convolution in time. But we also know that we saw in class that when we do these DFTs, we have to worry about having enough samples and frequency to avoid aliasing in time. So one thing this already suggests is that we need the number of samples that we use the whole way through in frequency to be big enough to get Y of N without aliasing. All right, so let's talk about that in the general term. Let's make a new page here. So imagine I have two finite length signals and maybe just sort of draw them cartoon style. So this is my x of n, and it goes from 0 up to, we'll call it m sub x minus 1. So its length is mx. And I want to convolve it, so I'll make my little star here, with h of n, which may have a different length. Right, so here's my little cartoon h of n and it goes from 0 out to mh minus 1. So it has length mh. Well, way back in the early first part of the semester, we saw when we convolved two finite length signals, even if I don't know what the values are, I know where the outputs will be, right? To find the output y of n, I add the starting points to get the starting point. So 0 plus 0 means this starts at 0 mx minus 1 plus mh minus 1 means the last point here is mx plus mh minus 2. So this gives me a length of mx plus mh minus 1. So that means I need my DFT samples here, and this is very important. I need that the DFT size n needs to be greater than or equal to mx plus mh minus 1. So I'm sort of planning ahead to avoid aliasing in the time domain. I'm using more samples than I would really need. Right? This should be more than enough for either x or h, but if I use this many samples in my DFT size, at least this many, that means I've avoided aliasing not only the original inputs, but any eventual output. Okay, so let's see uh, two choices of how this plays out. The, if we go to a new page here, so here's our example. So if I have a, a signal that looks like this, it'll be just one for the first three samples, and then minus one for the last two.
this is a sample that's five points long, this is my x of n. My h of n, let's say, is just three samples long. So the first thing, even if I need to find circular convolutions, it's very good to start with the linear convolution. Oh, I should have labeled these are both amplitude minus one here. And I'll show you in a minute that where, where this comes from, but in, in fact, cir any circular convolution can be written, can be computed in terms of thinking of a linear con the normal linear convolution we did back in chapter two, and then adding in the aliasing at the end. So if we want to think about that, so let's first start by saying, well, let's just do regular y of n will be x of n convolved with h of n. And I'm not going to go through this all step by step. You can go back and review the video on ticker tape or the other convolutions would be good to practice. But if we did that, let me see if I can just do this in real time. It would start at 0, and that would be 1, 2, and then uh, the peak would be at 3. The next sample would be back to uh, 1. The sample after that would actually be at uh, minus 1. So let me just, let me just slide the page up a bit here. How to do that, I think. Nope, that's not it. Oh, that's this hand over here. All right, so we slide the page up a bit so we can do that. Get back to our, our pen. So the next sample, let's see, at 3, it would be if I do the flip and shift in my that it was 1, and 4 it will be uh, minus 1. And the next point it will be minus 2 at 5, and back to minus 1 at 6, and that's the last output point, which is what we expect, because if we add the time index at the last point is 4 to the time index at the last point at h of n is 2, that gives me 6, so everything beyond this would be 0. So if there's no aliasing, this is what we want to end up with. Well, let me show you a bit where that, that aliasing comes from. Right, we could think of the, the sampling, we're saying, well, y of k, we know our, our samples in frequency, right? This is equal to y of e to the j omega evaluated at omega equals 2 pi over n times k, right? So we get capital N samples in omega. Well, we could think of it this way. If we say, well, what if I, I actually think of what happened to compute y is I multiplied the full discrete time Fourier transform. So I have x of e to the j omega times h of e to the j omega. I did that whole thing, and then I sampled that at these same frequencies. So I have a, I sample that at omega equals 2 pi over n times k. Well, it turns out this will be exactly the same value if I sample each of these individually. So it's like computing y of e to the j omega and then sampling gives me the same thing as if I sampled x and h and multiplied them again for a full range of capital N values of k. Okay, so that this is what leads us to the, this is often called circular convolution. And it's called that because it, this, this DFT-based convolution is a little different because it has this periodic aspect to it, right? We've made things periodic by, by possibly, by sampling them frequently, we have made them periodic in time. What we often want to do is make it still give us the same answer as regular convolution. And a good mnemonic to remember, a little word equation, is that circular convolution is equal to linear convolution plus aliasing, right? So we know that this is the same as computing if we're doing this in frequency, it's the same as when we multiplied these. We did the linear convolution, y v to the j omega here, and then we sampled in frequency. So it's just back to our first discussion of the DFT in class, where we say we're going to take that, that signal and then make it periodic every capital N. Well, as long as capital N is bigger than the output of that y, we should be okay. So to see what that looks like, let's, let's just, again, back up and remind ourselves. So our, our signal went 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, minus 2, 1. Let's copy that over. Oh, need a new pen. So we get our y of n here. That's the one that went 1, 
two, three, one, minus one, minus two, and minus one. So let's see what happens here if, if we did, uh, if we used n, the size of the FFT, equal to four, we'd be aliasing this signal every four, right? So if we had, that meant whether we calculate both x of k and h of k using a four-point DFT. Actually, I'm not sure that's even a real ego. Let me back up. I may take that back. All right, so let's, let's do five, because we don't want to alias x before we even start. So we look, suppose we were confused about how this works. We pick the DFT size that's five here. So we say that's, that should avoid aliasing x. What would we get? Well, one way to think of it is we would, we would say it's like we computed this convolution when we multiplied it. So let's call this maybe y1 of k. It's x of k, h of k using this, using n equals 5. Then y1 of n is y of n aliased every Right, we said we put copies every n, the FFT size, which is 5. Well, if we, we can think about doing that, but we can, we've all, once we've had a little practice with that aliasing, we can actually just sort of know that what happens is this stuff at the end here wraps around to the start. So let me redraw. I say it's 1, 2, 3, and one, need a little more space. So I slide up, pan up a little bit more. One, ah, too far. I got one, minus one, minus two, minus one. This is in time indices, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if I make the alias version, I say, well, I know I would put a copy, right? If I'm going to make copies of this, I'd make one version where I'd copy this over starting at n equals plus 5 and one at n equals minus 5. But the net effect, the only one we really have to worry about in this case is the one from n equals minus 5, right? If I took this signal and slid it to the left 5, and I'm going to make these alias, these things from the version on the left in blue, just to change it up and make it clear where it's coming from. So I'd have this minus 2, minus 1, minus... So minus 1, which would now be, if I'd move this left 5, 6 would be at 1, 5 would be at 0, this would be at minus 1, minus 2, 1, 2, 3 tall, Oh, maybe I do want to move that around. Just bring this over here and get it out of the way. All right, so it looks like this, and there'll be more copies going backwards. Another copy to the right here, uh, right that would start at plus five. I guess just to be complete, I should this first time out draw that. In. So I'd also have a copy here. If I had only taken five samples, I'd have an, oop, another copy that started here at five. I'll make that one green. So I'd have I'd go one, two. 3, 1, minus 1, minus 2, minus 1. This would be at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And it doesn't really stop there, right? There'd be a copy at 10, 15, and so on. But when we add these up, What we'd end up with within that, we just want to keep track for that first period, because that's all MATLAB is going to give us back. I'd have, oh, I'd forgotten to label this one. This one is minus 2. So for the final copy, when I add this up to get just the first period, it would be 1 minus 2. So that would be a, a minus 1. So 
So I have at, at zero, I'd end up with minus one, right? Which is one minus two. Here I'd have two plus a negative one, so that'd be plus one. And then the other values would actually, oop, the other values would be unchanged. Right, so I'd still have uh, something that was three tall here. One, two, three. Then one. And then minus one at four. So those would be my, that'd be my single period. And then it would repeat the periodic version would repeat outside of this, but what we're really interested in is what we would get back from MATLAB if we did this. So let's go over and I'll sort of do this the, the, just by hand. Let me uh, clear my workspace here. So we're going to define x to be the same signal we had all the way back here. So x will be 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 1. So I have 3, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1 are the values for x. And h is 3 ones. And so now I'm going to, just, just to make the comparison, I'll say y is the convolution of x and h. I know that ny, we want to go, to go from 0 to the length of y minus 1. Right, so if I call, I should have closed all my figures before I started. So if I make a figure for this, I can do a stem now of n, y, and y. Just to make it a little clearer, let's look at it first, and then we'll, we'll see how we might want to change that. So here we go, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, minus 2, minus 1. So just what we saw earlier. I mean, just tweak the limit of that a little bit. We'll open the x limits up a little bit so you can see a little clearer without it being right on the edge. Okay, so here's that figure. So here's at 0, it goes 1, 2, 3, 1, minus 1, minus 2, minus 1, like we talked about before. Okay, so there's our... Uh, linear convolution. So now let's see what happens if I do this circular convolution with n equals 5. So now I can say, we're going to call this x1 is equal to fft of x with of size n, and h1 uses the same size. If we're going to multiply them in frequency. Oop. That should be h and n. So then we can say y1 is x1 dot times h1. So that's multiplying the DFTs. And I say I want to find y1 is the inverse FFT of y, y1 and n. And now if I do a, uh, make a new figure, I can do a stem. From, this will go from 0 to 4 because it's 5 points long. I could do more generally. I could say that, stem of that with y1. I already know I'm going to need to, I want to tweak this a little bit to, again, make it so that I have a little room on the edges to see the first and last sample. So just to make my fancy plot, now let's look at figure 2. And there it is, minus 1, 1, 3, 1, minus 1. So it exactly fits what we expected, or what we found analytically. So this is what MATLAB did with the circular aliasing, but here I actually computed it through the frequency domain, and the point of this example is we can also just do it in the time domain, do the linear convolution and alias it will tell us exactly what would have happened, or what answer we'll get from when we do this. So that says, well what if I don't want to alias it? I know my output, my original output, is, is the length of, of those two added together, which is 7. I'm sorry, the length added together plus 1. I've got a 5-point signal up here, plus a 3-point signal is 8, minus 1 is 7, so that y is going to be 7. So if I do this again with n equals 7, I should avoid the aliasing.
So now let me get figure three out on the front. And there is the full unaliased version. It's the same thing I got from the linear convolution, but I computed it by computing DFTs and multiplying them together, but I just made sure the DFT was big enough that I don't alias my final answer. Okay, so there's a, a, a little review of circular convolution. That is the convolution we get by multiplying DFTs and also a, uh, an example both of the analytics thing and, and in parallel in MATLAB showing us how it works. There you go. Have a good day.